one of the most uh, influential leaders of the modern African church then was uh, the now late um, Reverend Father Janan Luum, who met his death at the hands of the state in 1977. But at least what we know is that the core principles for which he stood were aspects of you know, human rights, democracy, and good governance. Well, this country went ahead to set aside or earmark 16th February every single year to commemorate his passing on and celebrate his legacy. Today we convene as young people to discuss that what does his legacy, what he stood for, what does it mean for us as a country today and moving forward. That is phase one. Phase two, we shall spare some 20 minutes to talk about what's happening next door, and that is Democratic Republic of Congo. A country fresh from a general election finds itself in continuous conflict and turmoil. Well, this has been ongoing for as long as we can remember. Well, the efforts therein seem not to be yielding so much, so we shall talk about the long-lasting solution that Eastern Congo deserves, and, and that is Goma. Viewers, welcome this afternoon, and I'm joined by a panel of uh, remarkable young people who now I introduce to you and in no particular order. From the Forum for Democratic Change, and that is the Youth League, the party that is at conflict with itself, is, <laughs> is a member of the Youth League, and that is Ivan Masawi. Ivan, we are very happy to have you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senior Comrade Tedega, for hosting me. Uh, we bring our appreciations from the FDC Youth League to Civic Space, uh, CCG, and in particular for always considering us to be part of such uh, forums. I also bring you greetings from the youth in Mbale City, uh, where I also represent the youth. Uh, we are really happy to be here today. Thank you very much. Yes, we are very happy to have you as well. Like I said, no particular order here. Next to myself is the student of law, a budding lawyer from Makere University. The name is uh, Alan Ajuka. Alan, we are very happy to have you. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Chidega, once again for the opportunity to come and share and discuss matters of national importance. And it's a privilege to be on this set. I hope we'll learn from each other. Thank you. Um, the only lady on the show who has graced us with her presence is Winnie Akidi. Adile. Wow. She's uh, a youth uh, a youth and development uh, activist and, and practitioner. We are very happy to have you. Yeah, thank you very much, Kidega, for hosting me. Uh, once again, my name is Akidewini Adile. I'm a student of international relations and diplomatic studies, as well as uh, a youth and development practitioner in the civil society space. Thank you for hosting me. Yes, uh, we are very happy to have you. Um, next to win is the last gentleman on the panel this afternoon is... Uh, a lawyer by training and also a legal officer at Advocate Research Facility. Julius, no, Council Julius Buesij is the name. Julius, pleased to have you. Thank you so much, Delhi. Mm. And great thanks to the Center for Constitutional Governance mm. and to you in particular for the opportunity. I look forward to a wonderful debate. Let me just keep the microphone with you, and uh, because you have it. And the question that I would ask everyone is a, a general question: the legacy of Janan Luo. What does it mean to, to you personally? Uh, thank you so much. Um, to me, the legacy of the late Janan Luo is uh, a, a powerful legacy. And uh, to discuss this legacy it would be quite useful to ask ourselves one question. If Jinan Luwum was present mm. amidst us in Uganda today, would he have survived if he did the kind of things that he was doing under the reign of the late Idamin Dada? That's one limb of the question. Mm. The second limb of the question is what would happen if the current brand of religious leaders that we have in Uganda today would be subjected to the reign of the late Id Amin Dada? What exactly would be the result? Would Amin have a reason to fight them? Would Amin offer them land cruisers 
on their consecration days and a brown envelope, and they would walk around under the cover of non-intervention in political matters, and they would simply keep quiet on human rights concerns that we have in the country, and would, I mean, have found a reason to execute them just as he did, allegedly did, to the late Janan Ruhum. I use allegedly because the factual um, uh, establishment of that is not concluded, mm. but there is a high probability that indeed it was the state that orchestrated his death. So looking at the two limbs requires us to appreciate the lessons that we draw on the part of our political establishment, on one part, and on the part of religious leaders, on the second part. On the part of the religious leaders, what is it that a religious leader would draw from the legacy of Id Amin Dada, to, rather, sorry, uh, the late Janan Ruum, to stand up for justice with courage, no matter the cost. What do we have today? And when I talk about religious leaders, yes, the late Janan Ruum was from the Anglican uh, church. church, but when you talk about religious leaders today, you also include the born again churches, members from the Islamic faith. You ask yourself what exactly is the role of religious leaders in a democracy, in a democratic transition? What would be the role of Jesus Christ if he lived among us in, in the face of autocracy and human rights violations? Would Jesus Christ have opted for the softer landing space of indifference as his followers are having their blood being shed day in and day out? Politically, what would our politicians draw from this scenario? We have definitely quite a number of things. You ask yourself the first essence of having a holiday in memory of the late Janan Ruhum. To me, it would be a celebration of what we have achieved in line with respect for human rights and human dignity. Mm. But to celebrate the things that you are doing, to condemn the previous historical events that you are doing, because again, a person, where is the difference? The difference is that Amin was not a brilliant killer. He was not a smart killer. What we have today is smart killing. If Julius comes out as an opposition leader, no one will touch on Julius. But they will target my followers today. A Kidega who strongly follows me and makes a case in support of me, but he has no huge following, no media attention will be snacked and executed in military court. <laughs> court you know, and there will be such as all over the country, they will not find you, Kidega. But Julius will continue to flourish in liberty, drive his vehicle around and visit radio stations. While Amin on the other side would simply identify Julius and clear him off. There are different mechanisms but same setting. So in that situation, do we have the moral mandate to condemn the previous regimes? Good question. I think, Alan, let me come to you, and just from where Julius has, has, has ended, is that you look at our constitutional history as a country, uh, the, the level of human rights violations, be it under the Obote era, you remember um, the, the, the gross human rights violations, the likes of Matovo, I mean, those who were vocal, who seemed to oppose the regime, were dealt with in a very, you know, really difficult manner. So, so, so as we celebrate Jen and Ruhum, vis-a-vis -vis our human rights progress as a country, and also our democratic tra trajectory, what do you have to say? Well, thank you very much. I try to 
get interested in the circumstances under which Janan Rum died, the Archbishop then. It's not just the, an, a bishop, mm. an ordinary bishop. It was at the helm of the Church of Uganda leadership mm. Mm. and um, of the entire Christian faith in Uganda. He had a big part to play. Mm. And uh, one of the accounts, which seems quite convincing um, about the circumstances that led to the death of Janan Rum, is one by uh, Reverend Captain Isaac Baker. Mm. Retired, I th- he didn't retire, he just left the army. He was a, a military chaplain that time. So, what happened before the death is that there were lots of uh, allegations that the then archbishop had a connivance one with the, the English and also with the um, rebels mm. in Tanzania to bring in soldiers and attack and overthrow. And mm. also, there's an account by the the wife of the widow of the late, or with regard to the circumstances prior to his death. Mm. Uh, there's a time when they were, of course, at their home near the, the cathedral, um, Namilembe, and they were stormed by security operatives. They came looking for guns. Mm. The account says that uh, the archbishop had gone out of the country to meet with the general meeting of the other archbishops from other provinces. That time, Janan Rum was. The, uh, the, uh, the Archbishop of the province of Uganda, uh, Rwanda, I think Burundi, and Zaire. Mm. So he was covering a big part. He was a big man. So the, uh, I just wanted us to first put it in context, mm. the kind of man who was killed and the circumstances. And also, at that time when he had gone out on his return, the allegation was that when he reached Kenya, he was called to Tanzania, he met Obote, then he proceeded back to Uganda. Mm. A week before his death, the army stormed his home, searching for guns. But there was no gun. And the, the, the wife narrated, and I'm not aware if she's still alive, that they often called them to state house for questioning and threatened them, just threatened them, so that they, they mm. keep at par. And the very day he was killed, the corroborative accounts say that all the, the clergy, all the religious leaders mm. were called to state house during the day for a meeting. They're all summoned. That is how Captain Baker, who was just a chaplain in the army, mm. came to be part of the meeting. So that's an account of a first-hand uh, witness who was mm. there mm. that very day. So there were someone to state house. No, there was someone to Nile Martians. Mm. That's where they had to meet uh, the president and know why they had been summoned, including the Archbishop. They all came, the Catholics, the Muslims, the SDAs, and some people alleged that Amin had, you know, uh, he had banned the Pentecostal churches, but that's not true. It was just some pastors whom he deemed to be, you know, political in a way that at the end of the day they could have brought in terrorists, claimed to be pastors. He called them Bafedi. So mm. the, that, that meeting, uh, if you look out for the entire account, it was a threatening one. Mm. that they could get religious leaders, lock them in rooms, and then wait and hear um, the army in another room chant about their death, about their blood. Because the allegations were that in that very meeting, Mm -hmm. the one who gave the account says that they brought in a young man who had been tortured. And he gave a narration and connecting the archbishop to the kind of an, an, an impending overthrow of the president that he had connections with the terrorists. I don't want to over-rely on the account. Mm. But what I'm trying to show is the circumstances under which and the kind of terror that religious leaders were in. Mm. What was the reason why they are overbeing someone? Prior to that, the bishops had, uh, had protested a decision mm. by the president. And the president had made a certain statement, which in a way was against Christianity in general, like mm. fighting Christians. And he was regarding them as people preaching uh, the gospel of blood and death and all that. And one of the people who gave that account is the late Bishop Festo Chibendiri. Mm. And in his account, he says that they organized and met uh, the president with, uh, with the document, a letter, replying to his statement, telling him that whatever you're saying against the church, we stand for particular morals, we are many people, and we are Ugandans. 
So you cannot say that Christianity is this, this and that. So all that uh, at the end of the day culminated into uh, some kind of a furious man who mm -hmm. Amin was. So at the time what Baka says at the day of uh, his death, these guys were locked in a room as uh, church leaders. Amin and his soldiers were down in a, another room enchanting about their death. By the time they opened for them the room, mm -hmm. their cars had been taken by soldiers. They said, the rest of you are giving you 10 minutes, leave, go back, go, leave this, this place. But for whom? For you are under arrest. That was uh, Maria Mung, you are under arrest. So mm -hmm. they took him, kicked him, and put him in a car. That's the last time they saw him. And later on in the evening, that's when they heard that he had died in an accident. The other account shows that the Idi Amin was not present at the scene of the death because when he was taken away from male mansions, Idi Amin remained. And Baka gives an account that he came back with the then Archbishop of the Catholics to speak to Amin. He was in the room. He also gives an account that they rec he received a call and that seemed to be the time he died. Mm. So I just want us to put it in context that at that time, Idi Amin was a man who was ready for anything, but against any man who was against a political interest, mm. especially his, his office or his government. Mm. He would let the government run. People will ask and say that during Amin's time, we saw roads being constructed, mm. industries you know, moving on. How was Makere University running? Students give an account of like, food would be served, X, Y, and Z, save for lecturers disappearing here and there. Mm. Now, the, 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 the technicalities, mm. like the technocrats, remained. If you look at the who were the ministers in Amin's regime, mm. majority at first were civilians, totally civilians. They were, he looked out for technocrats, but anything concerning security, he was the alpha and omega. Anything concerning a rumor with regard to what was happening with his government, he would die. He would threaten ministers because they were civilians, and he would tell them, if we are, you are involved in anything like communicating with the, the rebels in Tanzania, you will die. Now, there was some kind of tense environment, working and religion. In our environment, in our Uganda today, I just want us to compare it with what is happening. Mm. I, can, I, I believe in progressive realization of human rights. Yeah. I cannot say that at one day we'll have some kind of human rights respect like it is in certain countries that we admire. But at the same time, we have spent long enough to learn from the past. So as, as it stands, we still have disappearances. We still have abrupt searches of people's homes. We still have the army besieging someone's home on account of, you know, they are suspecting you, so they have preventive arrest. Mm. They have to arrest you, which which, which preventive, for in which law, preventive so. arrest is in the law mm. and has no you know time limit. They can they can be a preventive arrest for any time they want. Mm. We are still in a situation where church leaders and I, I can say that the current status quo is that uh, the government knows how to handle religious leaders, but the religious leaders then were vocal. They stood face to face to the president and told him what you're doing is not right. They did not fear him. That's why Janan Rum was killed. The account of the, of the widow shows that he was mm. ready for anything at any time. But he said, because the other bishops all over the world were telling him, why don't you leave Uganda and come? Because all the elites were leaving Uganda. Mm. And he said, I will die with the last Ugandan. He was ready to speak. And when they were even, they would even be someone, they would come as leaders of people. Mm. So, what you see today is that there is a lot of, uh, I, to some extent, I'm a Christian, mm. a practicing one. Mm. Our church leaders of late mm. have in coiled, have, mm. in, okay, as I conclude, mm. have coiled back into personal interests. They do not appreciate, they have no kind of the Jesus, um, you know, uh, the saved relationship. The selflessness. The selflessness. The sacrifice. The sacrifice. Mm. For them, they are looking at what do I get as an individual. At the end of the day, when the government gives him a car, gives him money, and they hear that people in their diocese are being tortured, they won't say a word. They're so I can say that the government has them in their hand. At the end of the day, human rights violations will go on without the legacy of Janan Rum mm. being reproduced to them. Interesting. Winnie, the same question. The legacy vis-a-vis -vis the context that we have today. 
Oh, thank you. It's it's really very tricky to come after these two gents <laughs> after the submission. But mm. I would really just want to maybe add a voice and maybe share how his legacy was. Like um, when you come to the religious context, you know, with Christianity, pe- some people are looked at as martyrs, mm. and then like a, a particular perception, like an angle in which people really look up to the person in terms of offering them spiritual guidance. So if we are to look at uh, Jenna Rumi in his days, he offered both uh, spiritual guidance to the public, to the citizens, uh, not just within the context of Uganda, but then East Africa as well, given that he was um, a religious figure who was well viewed by the people within the diaspora within East Africa. Mm. But also in the political change and uh, in, in terms of fighting for social injustices, he was really very vocal. And that gives us to the perspective that um, Uh, my colleague here shared on on what the role of religious leaders are currently in today's context. You realize that um, back then it was only looked at, uh, in in his legacy, he looked at it as a moral obligation. He had to be exemplary to the citizens and to the masses out there that being a religious leader, he had the the, the capability to to offer them that spiritual guidance as well as the political Uh, the political change that they really needed in terms of showing how injustices were happening, given that the Amin's regime was actually attributed a lot of human rights violations, social injustices, and a lot of political conflicts that were happening then. Mm. But then in today's context of religious uh, leaders, as we see, uh, however much that uh, different councils have been formed that bring the religious leaders together, we realize that there is a lot of um, fear that has been infiltrated within these councils. And uh, most of these councils are not operating as individuals, but mm. then they have a, a bit of um, tension, like a push from the government at some point. And that makes it uh, a non-independent entity that fights for the, the social justices for the people in the community, as well as uh, giving the, the, the citizens an attribute of knowing that however much this is happening, the spiritual perspective is there. But then also realize that today, currently, Uh, given the legacy that uh, Jen and Loom had, realize that today currently we had we have religious leaders that are actually opting to stand for political uh, platforms. Like you have MPs who are actually pastors in their communities. So people have this zeal that, however much I am serving God, I can actually come up and also offer change as an individual because his legacy actually gives us the moral courage and the will to know that you can effect change not just. Um, as an individual, but also as a collective. You can stand as an individual as he did, mm. but then also if you have people around you, you could actually come up and champion social justices and change together as, as, as the people in the communities. But then also, if we were to draw back to what's actually currently happening, given the, uh, the, the legacy that he lived then, you realize that in doing all these uh, advocacy, speaking about, speaking your power to the truth, mm. your, your power to truth, uh, That, was, that he really did during his reign in the 1977, he realized that um, there is something that people don't really have right now. There is no freedom of speech. Much as in the Constitution it is there, the moment you speak your truth about something, a human rights violation, you risk being whisked away. And then that's really evident given what happened to Jenna Loom then. He realized that the moment you speak your truth, you stand at risk of being what? Whisked away or eliminated or actually put to trial because of speaking your truth. And that is something that now in this current trend, the democratic trend that is happening now, however much very many young people are getting up to speak their truth, mm-hmm. they actually speak it not with all the power and the zeal that Jan- Janan emulated then, but then they speak it with the perspective and the tension that I can, I can speak the truth, but not the whole truth. Certain Information are always withheld because the moment you speak the whole of it out there, you actually risk the way you're never safe. So that takes us to the to to one where, as the citizens of this country, as well as uh, the context of our neighbors within the East African region who actually witnessed his reign during uh, during the time where he was fighting for for fighting against the oppression and injustices that were happening then, realized that we have a lot that we could draw from his legacy and then apply it in today's current age. And the benefit is a lot has really changed over time when it comes to democratic uh, 
uh, reforms, democratic pers uh, perspectives of how elections are done, on how um, campaigns are done, on how mm. people speak their truth. Because those days, let's say for them, those days it was really analog. He would get his, uh, his uh, let's say, his, his group, the battalion he has, the rest of the religious leaders, mm. and he walks with them to, 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 to meet the president and all that. But mm. today, you don't really easily meet the president. And that gives us the notion that in this current era, as young people, as people who are advocating for change, as people who are fighting and speaking towards human rights, we have other, other avenues that we would actually use. And that takes us to digitalizations, the innovations that are already ha happening now. Mm -hmm. If we draw from the lessons that happened then, we could actually work out ways in which we can actually infect and push for the agenda that he pushed for, as well as fight for human rights in today's current era. Yeah. yeah wow, you. interesting. Yes, Ivan, you have the floor. Yeah, I want to thank you for posing really a very uh, good question. Uh, I want to just add one from where my brother Julius. The history of Uganda's governance and political space has been governed. Every messiah who comes to want to be a president will always come with two theories. I'm going to solve the issue of human rights and our uh, vote rigging. Mm. From independence, Obote, uh, you read it well, he only got misunderstanding with Kabaka Eka and Buganda, which could be uh, categorized as they got some issues even which led to human rights of the Obote and his army attacking the Ruviri, uh, destroying the Ruviri and forcing the Kabaka then into exile. I mean, he's capturing Obote. All that you will see there is always those who have to go to exile, those who have to die, or boat rigging. Come to a boat to easy return to power. How it went, people have to die. Someone has to come in via the an alliance in Tanzania and come back. But let's come to the latest 1980. Two things that took the current president to the bush violation of human rights and vote rigging. It's very clear in all his books, in all his statements, in all his talks. Obote is accused of vote rigging and human rights violations. So that is how the Messiah, Yoweri Kaguta Museven Kivokagurwa, now comes in to solve uh, such issues. But I'll go back to the significance of Janan Rumu, first as an Anglican, I know he, we learn a lot of symbolism from the church as leaders in the church, selflessness, uh, how best to serve the people. I think he, we know we only look at the point of his death, but people who had the chance, uh, my dad then was 28 years, to have been around that time, will tell you besides his death, there are certain character traits and other things Gen and Roma as a bishop had built that we as Ugandan maybe we narrowed out the small act of I mean taking his life. But why we still celebrate him, and I think why even the NRM put found it wise. Some of these people in the current government may have survived because of his efforts to push for an environment that sustained uh, advocacy, mm. that sustained activism, that su sustained dialogue from the church side. The real challenge, like my brother Julius put it, I think uh, learning and unlearning, we have had the issues with learning as Uganda, especially from our past. With, uh, those who observed and us who listened, I think the trend that the real issues that relate to the Ghanaian Romo's death, we can't today move very proud. I'm very happy the current Minister of Internal Affairs, General Kahindo Tafiri, tried to be very bold and open during the Ghanaian Romo address in Guru, mm -hmm. that whatever took us to the bush was violation of human rights, and uh, if you, you, you vote again, trying to use an example of 
some small league that had come up as an example but he would have first reflected from himself if what really they went through they, because just the last election in Uganda we had even 57 people die in one day because Godwin had been arrested in Luka we had people the frank centers as around Kampala all being stepped on by military vehicles the, we had just this very week Olivia Lutai and 27 others are still in the military court martial for being uh, issues of an election that ended three years ago, for being uh, participants in an election, for supporting an opposition candidate, that to a level that MPs are denied to be your bail surety, to stand for your bail. So I think we needed to learn certain lessons uh, that may have demonized Amin. I think we are, if Amin was to one day wake up and compare his character with the current, I think we have just been smarter in his character, but we have not been any different. Religious leaders, my sisters put it clear that they have been very involved in politics. In Mukono, we have seen the Reverend Bakal was an MP with a caller. He's now the current LOC5. In Fort Porto, we have a mayor who is a Reverend. In the guru, we have seen many of them come, but the why the acts of Janan Roma, I think, make very many people feel guilty is because of the boldness, but and the fact that many of us, especially those who claim to be church leaders, have not stood by the values of Christ's teaching, if at all those who believe in Jesus are also there. Uh, in Islam, I don't know where to quote where there was such, because uh, Islam is quite very symbolic mm. in the way they practice. But I think sh your question should, especially to us, the young people, should call us to consciousness. To really see that certain patterns we still have a lot to do to break them down. Mm. These are patterns that we have not broken down because we have also interested ourselves in wearing the same identity. Identity of saying we are very learned, but we are very insecure. We are very learned, but we are very comfortable. We are very learned, but it is too risky out there. I, uh, Room, we, I think what he did is to stand out and he stood out alone. But very many people have taken the very course, died and have even been captured in no way. Mm. I know very many people in this country who have died of political related crimes, uh, political related attachments, but are captured in no way. So we need to learn from our history. We need to learn from uh, the acts of the past leaders, us who are in leadership places, we need to advocate more. Uh, at least I've had lawyers here really give highlight on human rights. I did re receive a book from Dr. Livingstone Sewanyana. He wrote a book, Human Rights in Uganda, mm. The Elusive Promise. Uh, one of my questions to him is why he had over 40 chapters, but some chapters having three pages, four pages, two. Mm -hmm. He told me, you're still a younger man, but the reason I've managed to live to this extent is all this literature. is because I only write that which will paint the real image of what is underground. Mm -hmm. So we need to invest in ourselves more in advocating to be better than what has existed before. Yeah, wow, very interesting. Julius, let me come to you. You're a lawyer, so you know what happened in 1215, the Magna Carta, and the opening word there we know that, you know, every man is born equal. You know, you're born with an inherent right to life. So some of the things that Luwum fought for, may so rest in peace, was that the aspect of equality for all. You know, we are all born equal, we should all have a fair chance at be it uh, politics, be it access to social services, and all that. So if you compare what he stood for with regards to equality for all, and what we have today, 
would he be proud of, of what the country is or has become? And thank you so much. Uh, and maybe you could uh, talk more on the democratic uh, 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 context of things, because like you were saying, that some people are arrested for supporting candidate X, then the others are, you know, led to even open up uh, institutions that are sort of questionable. So, I the, think we need to give a, the, the church a discussion as one of the dead institutions in this country. Yeah. <laughs> because all these are institutions that should be independent in their line of operation. Yeah, fair enough. Shall get to that? Because mm -hmm. I, I know that the exit of, of, of Arab Moy was championed by yes, civil society, yes. the church and things like that. Mm -hmm. You go to uh, the, the Arab Spring, mm -hmm. the exit of Austin Mubarak in Egypt mm -hmm. was, champ was championed by mm -hmm. the yes, Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah. So I, I, I agree with you and shall get there, but for now, give us the aspect of democracy and equality for all. All right. Thank you so much, and thanks, my dear guy, for, for that wide framework. Mm -hmm. But human rights mm. remains the Achilles heel of the modern day Uganda. You know, the Achilles heel, the weakest point mm. that one can identify in Uganda's governance system is the aspect of human rights. Mm. We have created a country that is structured in a way that some people are more equal than others. What's very unfortunate is our focus on which rights to talk about and which rights to ignore. Mm. Yes, civil rights have taken the center stage as always, but you know of economic rights. If you focus on the way our economy is structured, and the manner in which the people of Uganda have been economically isolated by the various policies that we run in the country, that's when you would identify the magnitude of the problem and the indifference of our leaders. When I talk about our leaders, I mean a combination of both political and religious leaders. Mm -hmm. If you see the rate of um, unemployment that we have in the country, for example, and the manner in which it's not a priority. Mm. You know, you have a staggering, I have always mentioned on this particular forum, yes, environment. a staggering 85% of youth not employed and you're educating more and more of them. I am seeing that we have over 99 billion of the funds invested in the loan scheme for higher education, not returned, people are not paying back because we are training them and sending them into the village to go and cultivate. But they don't even have the means to start the cultivation process itself. That's a violation of human rights because people are supposed to be economically empowered. Our focus is only on those that have been put in jails but we are not looking at, at issues to do with gender empowerment. Our approach to notions of gender remain very delicate. When we talk about gender, we mean that young girls must be empowered. Young boys who are vulnerable must be identified and empowered, not pushing one gender against the other. Not only picking people that we are comfortable to work with under the mask of gender, then you identify one particular actor and you appoint her and place her somewhere. You know she has no skill, she has no talent. You surround the whole country with a team of puppets, those that cannot make decisions, those that have the, cri the lack, those that lack the critical mind to question the number of inept national policies that we run in the country and you only have yes men jumping over helicopters jumping over suvs attending kiosks at night in jinja 
and then you come on the national media and say, I have promoted gender equality, I have a prime minister who is a female, I have a vice president who is a female, I have a speaker who is a female. Are we able to offer a career open to talent as an aspect of human rights? Because equality before the law calls for that, that this young man, brilliant as he appears to be, upon his graduation, he has access to state house. And state house is gracious enough to advertise the positions that they have there through the public service. Mm. And he can apply on merit on the basis of his grades and he can be appointed there. How many of us, for example, have had an opportunity to study under the scholarship, the scholarship schemes that are run by state house? But do you know how many they are? They are uncountable. Many of the cadres are sending their children in China to study and prepare well to come over and rule over us. Many of the cadres are sending their children to Singapore, to USA, and many other countries because these countries send direct suggestions to State House and they pick the opportunities, hand pick. So when we talk about equality before the law, in line with the legacy of the late Jinan Ruhum, we espouse greater ideas of opportunities to a greater population. And these opportunities are given on the basis of merit. Let the best person take it. Let the best person be the executive director of KCCA, not the former child of a fighter in Royal Triangle. Let the best person be the executive director of Uganda Airlines. But also, when we talk about equality in line with the contemporary dynamics, we further stretch our focus to issues of remuneration. You know, we have a national army. You have a couple in the army who does the donkey's work. Mm -hmm. Carries, carries all the guns, is responsible for night patrols, it rains on him on our streets, he responds to the first call to war when there is an emergency, his payment is a paltry $100, 380,000 shillings. You have another general taking with him over 15 million shillings. And when people are questioning, yes, the payments are poor, you summon a few generals, you increase their salary, as you leave those poor young men in the military forces working under deplorable conditions. That's another area that government sons and daughter to our land may be interested in as far as interrogating the right to equality is concerned. We need to look at the manner in which we renumulate workers with the same qualifications that's living alone the military. If, for example, you walk in and, uh, and, and, and visit our parliament, you will be intrigued <laughs> to understand that, that you have someone there with a single degree receiving like double fold the salary that you for example receive if you're a primary school teacher but you all have degrees that's a form of discrimination so the idea of equality remains elusive to us as a people in the modern day uganda and what's the role of religious leaders? Of course, I cannot forget the legacy of Jinan Ruom. You have an entire diocese under your supervision. And upon your consecration, your first petition is to be given a land cruiser, VX, GXR. You know, that sport one that looks <laughs> very, very crazy. You want to live in opulency. 
heading a population that is ravaged by jiggers, malaria, and other treatable diseases. This is the manner in which we have relinquished our responsibilities and forgotten about the legacy of those that have been there before us. You have an entire cohort of bishops. Today when you are appointed a bishop, I think some of them don't sleep until that car comes in, in those white buferas. No, late they even petition themselves, like the case in Luero. So in their vote reading is in bishop elections. You see, mm -hmm. in Kabali, Reverend Bishop Gad Akanshuma mm -hmm. was was given um, a, a, a small a small car. A Ronald Cleos. That's what he was given on his consecration. Mm. At the end of the consecration, mm. he refused to step in it. He preferred the old land cruiser for the diocese. And the lady was like, hey, how come the archbishop has refused the car from the state house? Mm. And the people started whispering, he has refused it. It didn't take three months before an entire L300 land cruiser, <laughs> 750 million shillings started rolling from a state house to Kabari. You know, to the extent of a religious leader. You know, what's so, the legacy of the man that we follow? We follow Jesus Christ. So did he accept the... Oh yeah, he even <laughs> on the, the press briefing uh, and started explaining how this one is powerful, how it gives enough energy to come to Kampala to attend workshops, and, and how how it will climb mountains in Kigezi, and, and he looked to be a very joyful man. Trust me, in 2026, you will see him campaigning vigorously. His mission is different from the mission that Jesus Christ left. And that's the origin of the dilemma. Well, Jesus rejected donkeys and, and uh, horses and, and preferred horses. Mm. These ones are in for horses. Mm. Donkeys, they don't want horses, and, and they have known their purchase price. Oh, yeah, thanks. Interesting. <laughs> it, hey. We are due for short commercial break. Yes, <laughs> no, it's time to just add on to what he's saying. I think just takes us back to understanding the legacy around leadership. Mm. What people these days lately service. define leadership is it service or it's more of taking back mm. from the communities? Mm. And I think that's one thing that religious leaders are actually grappling with. Mm. Yeah, it's more of a transaction, not just with the religious leaders, but also with the mm. MPs, the people we elect in power. Mm. It's we elect them to go and serve us as as the people we've really put in that in that political position or in given the power to, to give us uh, maybe to take us in a particular direction of change or something. But in the end, the turn against us, instead of serving us, we actually end up serving them mm -hmm. indirectly. And that takes us to the notion of questioning what is leadership in the context of democracy in Uganda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's where we shall begin from after the short commercial break. Yes, the viewers, we are due for a break, but uh, stick with us and uh, see you shortly after. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten and a right for protection of minors, among others. The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. Uh, we'll be back from uh, that short uh, commercial break. Uh, well, Alan, uh, I think the question that um, Julia has asked, I'll just try to paraphrase it and put it to you. If you may recall um, the fall of Austin Mubaraka in Egypt, 
was inspired and led by civil society. And in that context, it was the Muslim Brotherhood. If you look at Arab Moy's exit from Kenya's politics, it was the pressure was largely from civil society, which was um, you know the church and things like that. And uh, and the the examples are countless, right? So when you bring it back to our context here in Uganda, what role does has civil civil society played in shaping the aspects of human rights? The aspect of democracy, putting into context the existing laws like the NGO Act that puts in place so much restriction to their actions. The NGO Bureau, I think of of I think sometime the other year, DGF was suspended. So what environment? Because we might be saying, okay, NGOs, sorry, civil society is not doing enough, but what environment are they operating? <coughs> First of all, churches are registered as NGOs yes. <laughs> when you're registering a church. Yeah. So they are part of a society that is supposed to be vocal yeah. with regard to human rights. They have a platform, religious leaders and other civil society leaders are people who usually have access to real people. Ah, yeah. also they also have access to the government most of the times. Easy access, actually. What usually, you know, the usual challenge is do they speak to the issues or they go there for their personal, you know, enrichment? There's been a lot of, you know, submissions with regard to how bishops and what get a lot from the government if you compare with the past. Then it was quite different. If it was a bishop, it is the people to collect for you and buy you a car, not the government giving it to you. So the environment you're asking about is a kind of environment that one, the government has been very, you know, crafty in in organizing how these organizations and civil societies, like how they operate, mm -hmm. both by law and in practice. If a, an organization seems to touch a political interest or seems to be speaking against a certain aspect that is threatening you know, the regime, then they will see a way either to eliminate it or to restrict its operations and threaten its existence. I just wish to stick to the legacy of Janan Rumi. The day he died, when these guys were leaving uh, Nile Martians, all the Christian leaders left marching and singing. It was some kind of demonstration by the several accounts that have been given. Of course, people were scared. That's why you'll hear very few people speaking about those kinds of stories. But the, fa the people who are there physically give the very account as they walked back to Namirembe. And they were very vocal. They stood their ground because they had some level of independence as they interacted with people. But currently, you see, when we were in our second year, we were doing our family law classes, we read a certain case of Alcad and Skinner, and one of the judges said that religious influence is one of the highest forms of influence. Mm -hmm. Religious okay. leaders mm -hmm. and civil society leaders, I say they have a closer interaction with mm -hmm. the people, sometimes more than the government. These guys are just aloof to what is happening <laughs> to the real life on ground. But these church leaders go to the small churches deep mm -hmm. down there. They understand how people behave. Even the way people bring the offertory and what, they know how those people are living economically, socially, in the matters of education. The church and other civil societies have a hand in education and what. They know what happens. So the challenge is this. It is that there is loss of sensitivity. And sensitivity has been, you know, turned off. If per se it is a, it is a lamp, it has been switched off by something, which is money. The incentive to side with certain acts of human rights violations or to be silent about them. To me, when you're silent about a human rights violation, you stand with it. Mm -hmm. So the silencing factor currently is financial. I don't think there's too much. There are, there are lots of threats. I can say there has been progress in regard to respect of freedom of you know, association in matters of religion, that many religions are coming up Many church leaders are doing whatever they want in their churches, making people clap for hours, 
making people do whatever they want. And they freely do it, and even the government provides them security. But these people still have a feeling that we must side with everything the government says. We must not, like they are promoting docility in the religious perspective, promoting, uh, you know, being docile, even in the organization and civil societies that are supposed to be, you know, vocal, even those societies that present, you know, workers and what, mm. they, they, you know, they are, they are quiet. There was a scenario where I think it was uh, the leader of the Medits, mm. that guy then, who knelt down. Dr. Francis already. Before the, <laughs> before the president. Mm. I, for one, I have a lot of respect for President Museveni. Mm. You cannot compare the time of Idi Amin with, with today. Mm. There has been progress. Like, it is the reality you must face. Mm. But if a child is to grow, and it's some level of stunted growth, that must be criticized. We must be ready for positive criticism. But on the other hand, acknowledge the progress. But if you realize that a leader of a civil society Lives, li reaches the level of kneeling before a president. Medical Uganda, medical and making if you government. Government. And, and, make, out and now <laughs> she's a minister. And, <laughs> and making a political statement in the name of other members of the society. Sorry. It shows the extent to which there is some level of insensitivity. Cool. Whereas you have your own personal sentiment towards the president, it is yours. Mm -hmm. You're representing a people that have their own reasons that they're striking every day. Mm -hmm. Are you trying to say that we should ignore the strikes of all doctors, interns, and what? That for you today, you feel like the president has done the best? No. He has done some things well. There has been progress, education. We've seen more hospitals coming up. Even if we don't have enough facilities in the hospitals, you cannot compare it with the time of Amin. But don't we need better things than we have today? So I think the, the, there has been some kind of I don't know how best to phrase it, mm. whether to say that there's complacency, whether to say that there's settling for less, whether to <laughs> say that people are up to what they want, not what the society wants, even when they come in the name of civil society and you know, religious uh, uh, arrangements. We have the interreligious council, which sits and at the end of the sitting, everything to some extent is facilitated by the government, which is not bad because the government represents the people. And uh, in its representation of the people, the church, as I said, has great influence amongst the people. And the churches and other religious uh, groups have people that the government provides services with. So all those channels are ways the government can reach out to them. But if you find that leaders in those respects, you know, sometimes we talk about parliamentarians, we talk about people in political spaces that they are quiet, they have been given money, they are silent. But church leaders of today have a bigger voice than some politicians. Yeah. If they could come on account of the following they have, mm. the influence they have to even call people to gather and clap for three hours. Mm. If they came and said that me and my followers, if you continue with these kinds of disappearances of people, mm. we are not ready to continue supporting this kind of governance. Not to demonstrate against government but to be vocal and open. Mm -hmm. And where necessary, stand before the president and speak to him. Mm -hmm. The access these guys have almost every month yeah. is not comparable to other spaces. So you can say mm -hmm. that there is a lot that suffocates the being vocal, civil societies, especially with regard to self-enrichment. And in all, the legacy of Janan Uhum should teach us that we must remain sensitive to the people that we lead as religious leaders. At the same time, civil society leaders should also remain sensitive to the kind of people they lead. At the end of the day, what will be remembered of you is what you did for the people, not what you did for yourself. Yes, Very interesting. Winnie, as we conclude that the issue of Jan and Lohum, is that you may recall that Jan and Lohum was very vocal in terms of, you know, we need to empower everyone, whether you're a man, a woman, Everyone deserves, you know, equal empowerment. As we look at our, as we look at the progressive realization of that particular agenda, is that is it a matter of form, as he was putting it, that okay, yes, you have the vice president, you have the words, but that is just form. Like, what is mm -hmm. the actual substance? You know, women, young women, still continue to suffer gender-based violence. So, 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 what is the context of women empowerment? in today's, um, you know, reality vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, what 
no woman that aspire to see. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, in today's context of women empowerment, I believe uh, it's all about giving the women the opportunity to be able to fend for themselves. However, you realize that over the years, a uh, majority of women have, have really been empowered vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the number of uh, young boys and young men who have been left out that uh, uh, my colleague here, Aliaron, mentioned. And that takes to the context of uh, feminism that has always uh, come up, however much it was there back then. Mm. The context over the years has evolved in that uh, people are perceiving it in a different way. That is more women fighting men, mm. which in actual context, feminism is all about uh, equality, providing for both, which is something that Jana Nulum uh, stood out for in terms of equality, provision for equal access to opportunities for both male and women, uh, for both male and female. Mm. But then in the context of reality is um, most civil society entities have come up to mostly empower women, given the, the statistics of the data that is in the societies, in the communities that show that women are the most oppressed. And I think that is basically because um, uh, given the cultural context of the communities we come to, we, or we come from, uh, men are perceived to be very strong, and a man who comes out and openly speaks about being violated by a woman in the community is actually perceived as a very weak man. Now, the notion of the, the society norm that oppresses a man to speak up is actually something that is uh, creating a loophole in the data that the civil society organizations use to actually channel and target funds towards uh, empowering the communities. That's why there's only mostly data that actually speaks towards the challenges women are facing than what men are facing. And that is something I always tell the men around me. If you're being beaten, if you're being violated, speak up. You could be the one man. You see, my colleagues are actually laughing. You could be the one man who changes the norm outside there because most of civil society work is channeled towards the data, the evidence that is actually built in the communities. But then that also takes you back to also the democratic forces, the spaces within the societies and the governments that is currently reigning within Uganda. You realize that uh, for you to run or to take on a political uh, uh, position. Let's say, for example, if I win, you wanted to go and run for uh, a woman can, uh, a woman MP position in Lira, first they would ask me, am I married? Do I live with my husband? Do I have children? And so the context of, am I able to sustain a community if I don't have a man besides me? Now, those are also the notions that civil society entities come to empower me, to, to make them know that they can stand in those positions as well as vie for those uh, positions of power without yeah, actually, e e exactly. Now that is something they're trying to break because now <laughs> the democratic forces and also the community cultural context married. actually yeah. sees in that you have to be married to be there. That's why there's a lot channeled towards empowering women for them to know that they can actually do this without uh, them evidently saying that they actually have to marry a man uh, in order for them to take on those positions vis-a-vis -vis a man. A man could actually go rally. If he could wake up right now and just go rally for a position, and he'll be given okay. because yeah. they he believe. The wife, he will be asked for be a asked. wife, but his chances against a woman who is going in there without a partner is actually higher. Mm -hmm. So those are the notions that we really need to break if we are to actually effect and push for equality in terms of the democratic spaces we have. But that also tailors you back to the different... Uh, uh, let's say the tailored clusters within the, 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 the parliamentary settings, let's say the women's parliamentary uh, committee, the health committee, the parliamentary affairs committee, oh. you get like there's always this balance where they want to ensure that there is that neutrality, affirmative action. affirmative action, the representation of women in the in the spaces. And that takes you back to these women who already have the cultural context and social context that they can't take these positions, if we don't come in a civil society, then to empower them and ensure that they get in there, then there's no way going to have those women take up those positions. And that also, they say a man cannot stand without a woman to support them. So you need us to empower those women to come and stand in those positions with you. But then also, um, if we are to date back to the context of Jan and Lum's legacy, in his legacy, one of the lessons that we pick up is the ability that whoever you are, it doesn't matter what position or what religious affiliation you come from. As long as you have the power and the voice to speak your truth, you could actually champion change and effect, uh, uh, effect the political landscape as an individual as long as you speak your truth. 
And that is something that we're trying to channel. You don't really have to say that. You only have to empower men for them to speak up the truth. The men are also there. That's why these days you realize that there's so many men who are also starting to come up. This, those days you'd hear the notion of single mothers. These days they're single fathers. And men are taking on these roles and, and, and responsibilities to come up and say, yes, we can do this. It doesn't really matter that whether you're a woman or a man, these are positions of power that we really need to take. And we all deserve the equity, the balance to ensure that we push for the landscape that is holistic enough for all the species mm. to live uh, and actually take our change and enforce impact within the communities that we're in. Yeah. But nonetheless, it all dates back to the risks that are associated with all this evidence that comes up when the data is collected. Mm. And that's why you say, uh, the equality around uh, gender-based violence that is happening. A lot, yes, I know a lot is happening, but then much as a lot is happening, the avenues where men also need to be sensitized to, not just men, but then also some of these particular bodies, let's say the police, mm. uh, the health uh, the health service providers, they really need to be empowered enough to know how to handle some of these cases. Because uh, in such a scenario, a, a woman would be blamed. Why disrespectful to the man? Or a man would be blamed. Why are you over drinking? But then there are loopholes of mental health challenges, uh, issues around unemployment that he, he spoke of that actually spikes up the yeah. poverty levels. And majority of these people are not able to take care of their communities, yeah. uh, to take care of their families, and also to ensure that they provide for these families. That's why there's a lot of this. And this is not just a women issue, but yeah. also a men's issue. That's why the legacy of Jan and Rum that pushes for equality and equity really needs to be upheld yeah. in today's government and also in the daily returns of the community. Yeah, I, I mean, um, rightly so, because, you know, I think it is not enough to say that we have women in positions of power, and yet... Um, Impact. They, they're, they're actually they having the positions of power, but they're not being effective. Yeah. Every single day. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that the numbers that we have of women in political spaces should translate into... Efficiency. The, 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 the efficiency, but also the actual empowerment of women in their... <laughs> You if know, I could just add into yeah. that, that takes you back to what Julia said, the, the merits. What are the kind of women you're taking to those positions? Is it because they have someone there who is taking them, who is opening Where a platform for them to get in there? Are are exactly. Mm. The women who are already in those Merit political process. spaces, in those offices, are not nurturing and mentoring other young women to be able to take over those positions and effect the impact that we need. That's why you see, there are very many women who've taken over these spaces, but they're not actually being effective enough to produce the outcome and the impact that we need. That's why you see some of the advocacy around uh, championing change around the, the maternal mortality rates, the infant mortality rates, actually low because the women who are there don't really have don't, that yeah. at heart. Some of them are not there out of merit. They're there because someone opened the door for them, yeah. not a merit door, but then a nepotism door or mm. a tribal door or mm. a, a class door mm. and that is why oh, those okay. with the ability and those with the passion and the zeal to fight for certain issues such as that are actually left out there and that's why you get majority of them now in the civil society who are doing groundwork mm. in correlation with the religious leaders where he actually mentioned the religious leaders have really a very great um, influential position when it comes to sieving into the communities the community's perception. And actually, this is something I always tell myself, the religious leaders could actually be a very, very big problem mm. to this country, or they could actually be a very, very big positive mm. uh, particular uh, sector within this country because they have the ability to influence the mindsets of the communities that we mm. come from. That's why you see most of the civil society entities are actually working with religious entities mm. to sieve through in the, through the communities where you actually get majority of these women with the merit and the passion to fight and advocate for these issues are there vis-a-vis -vis mm. their indulgence into those who are already into these permanent positions in government because mm. once you're there, the door is, sh is shut. Literally, mm. that what you're supposed to do is actually preempted before it's you even it. know. So it's, yeah. it's a closed door vis-a-vis -vis what is open within the civil society and the religious context of advocacy. Interesting. Wow. Uh, Ivan, as we conclude this particular topic, is that the regime that uh, the late Jana Nlugum was vocal against was one that abolished political parties. I think by uh, decree, one of the decrees of 1992 
abolish political parties. So today, yes, we have political parties, true, but in the context of our progressive democracy, are these is multi-partisan working? Looking at the internal context of uh, political parties, you look at FDC, you look at UPC, they are all at war with themselves. So uh, political parties uh, in the context of you know democratization of this country. Before uh, I go to the question of political parties, I want to uh, carry on from where my brother, the lawyer, left it. Mm. The role, you know in Uganda we are even lucky, we have a full interreligious council. Whenever the president hosts them is when you know you even have, you see all sorts of attires. The number of religious leaders are even more than the problems we have. You will see all <laughs> kind of dresses, capes, hoods, what? Parading at state house as if an army. Religious leaders have a role in modeling ethics. The current corruption we have. You know, I feel sorry that we blame seven even for our laziness. Sometimes the biggest challenge I think he has created is an environment for those who wish to inherit it. It will be very hard for you to have impact and cause growth and advancement. But if we are to be honest, the laziness of people like religious leaders, traditional leaders, and some sort of, some of us Ugandans who have taken to ourselves to be compliant with the situation, we are responsible for the current vices, situations. He has given an example. They can make youth clap for three hours, <laughs> but they can't preach or have solutions of how to employ young people in the church how to advise people to, even in the church setting, they teach work. If you did CRI, there is work in a changing society, all kinds of stuff. So they have also contributed to the current environment. But they, I think, really, if General Room was to come to Uganda, he would feel let down. May he so rest in peace. Coming back to your question, you know, the political parties in Uganda today, when you're in an environment that has been made to justify your existence but not your productivity, we shall just, it is an environment of survival. If you wake up today and say you have consultations, you will be beaten, some people's limbs will be broken, you will be arrested. And yet you have borrowed the money even to organize a rally. <laughs> you're a party. People can pull any member of you from here, be given an offer and compromised. I think even areas of parties dialoguing as parties were killed. Now it is individuals. I think we have had a lot of individuals in, in our multi-party politics. That is why it has had issues with growth. I come from the FDC. I know what we have gone through because we had an individual who was to be seen more as more greater than the party. Yeah, and I feel easy. sorry for NRM that when their time comes, I, uh, uh, it is why I'm in love with Otafiri's words lately. He has begun seeing it. I think we need to learn as a young generation if we ought to really benefit anything from whatever we are trying to pretend that we are implementing. To really reduce individualism in parties, but build institutions, just like I've given you an example of the interreligious council. Mm. Bishops, sheikhs, what, <laughs> pastors, witch doctors, even witch doctors are part. They go there, you'll find Mama Pina that I'm also from State House. Mm? But what role are you playing in helping this person, giving you an envelope? At least, I don't feel seven in the evening feels better. <clears throat> that is hearing issues of youth who maybe are in, uh, unemployed, are being taken abroad for work, maybe in the Middle East, some are uh, being exploited, some are maybe seated home. Do you think he cares? I am, um, this is why I'm saying I don't think, even if he cared, but it is not his sole responsibility. I think we are always in Uganda, we have reduced our, even us, our personal responsibilities to government. Because we have a role to call it to accountability. But because we have been beaten, personally we have been arrested, some of us, so you say, ah, but the cross you carry for seeking accountability. 
He yeah. runs our budget. I'm sorry to interject. He runs our budget, and it's not his responsibility to make sure that the youth that are trained in the country have a budget and skills that are, you know. Uh, I gave you a highlight that he has created an environment where he can survive. The current environment in Uganda, you discuss illusion as reality. But really, when you move outside, the real fact of affairs, we are in a country where the question is very clear, how have political parties built or got or enjoyed or benefited or got trouble from such the, the current existing space. Mm. But I have told you the truth. There is a multi-party act on paper, political party and organization act on paper, but you go towards the elections. They will beat you, they will arrest you, <laughs> they will use money. If possible, they will ensure all your relatives, some even run away from this country, they will switch off for your funding. Hmm? They will do whatever it takes. So they are not fools. They just wait for the right time to do it. At the moment, they can leave you, move around, come here, use your FDC shirt, that your more FDC, they are watching you. They are not fools. But they know where to say, at least if you have warned them, they will read you. They will <laughs> declare someone else. So even those of you who are lucky that God said, maybe in your times, you will really maneuver the enemy. Hmm? But coming back to your question, I should say it has been mm, it has been challenging. Uh, I think, in all in all, given this is a panel which is a program of young people, we ought to be better. Our doing better is we need to learn from this. The biggest challenge we have is what we are going to inherit from the current government. It deserves us to work extra hard if we ought to give our children something more better than what we have gone through. Mm. That is it. Interesting. So, guys, we have 10 minutes. So, the issue of Democratic Republic of Congo. I'll just give us each um, three minutes, and in, the, in those three minutes, you will make um, a progressive solution about Congo because I think we know the context. Mm. What is happening there, it has been there for a long time. So, what is the progressive solution? What do we propose as young people? So, um, Julius, I'll begin with you. Your comments on Congo and your parting shots at the same time. Yeah, thank you so much. Three minutes? Yeah, sure. There is no singular party that has the resources to stage a war for one, two, three years against a sitting government. If you see such an individual sustain a war, you know there are external forces that are behind that war. And that explains tacitly the, the dilemma that we have in the Great Lakes region. Mm. Congo is the plate, the silver plate, of all the resources that we have in Africa with very, very many forces interested, right from European corporations to the aggressive neighbors, Uganda, Rwanda, and several other actors. Mm. And the war that we have there cannot be resolved by external forces again. It must be internally generated. How do we generate an internal remedy? It is centered, one, on the ability of that country to invest in its education first. It must be a long-term program. Mm. Its ability to generate a domestic army, well-trained and well-equipped, to fight and counteract those external aggressive forces. Because the problem of Congo is one of scramble and partition of Africa. Mm. We have very, very many corporations interested in minerals there. They are funding these wars to create instability through our countries. I want to give you an example. At a certain point, around 2012, uh, Sultan Makenga, one of the leaders in uh, North Kivu province, uh, uh, was captured. Was, you know, he sort of you know, resigned and 
led his delegation of 100 soldiers into Uganda. Correct? They were received at Bunagana border. Who knows where these soldiers went? Did you get a report that they were handed over to Congo because the law under international law mm -hmm. is that you receive such hostile forces by traumatic means, you hand them over to the aggrieved country. Mm -hmm. Have you had any report to do with that? Absolute silence. Okay? At a certain point, John Bosco and Aganda crossed over to Kigali. He was received together with his forces. Mm -hmm. There is nothing about them handing off uh, such Belgian forces to to Congo. So the problem precisely must be dealt with internally and Congo must get back onto its soul searching and establish its true identity that is progressive in nature. Well, mm -hmm. interesting. Alan, wait for what for Congo? Congo, um, Congo is like a person who has ulcers <laughs> and then has wounds on top of the belly. Mm. Those who see the wounds on top bring medicine to heal what is on top. But the one that eats feels the inner pain. For many years, they have tried to heal the wounds. But you never know, they come from inside. Congo, the people of Congo are pawns in the chess game. They are being played by a number of players. I don't attribute the issue of Congo to any Congolese. Circumstances gradually and historically acknowledged from colonialism to having some people of Rwandan origin being, you know, left the part of a Belgian, you know, side of Zaire and now Rwanda later being alone. Some people in Zaire wanting to push those, you know, in uh, Congo whom they call Rwandese to go to Rwanda. They don't want them to go with their land. You understand? Now, what is fighting within, what us, for us, what we see outside is that there are some people in Congo who are killing each other. Those are the wounds we see on top. But inside, there is a problem that cannot be solved from within. If the problem is starting from within, as my colleague shared, it is high time that Congo, of course, the, there are funny steps that have been taken, and I think these, these steps have not been well calculated in, you know, the manner in which forces from other countries have been sent away. I know there are reasons, mm. but the forces that are also coming in from other regions having sent away East African region, UN and what, and then you bring in SADC and what, mm. you remain with the same problem that you're supposed to solve yourself. The people of Congo must devise a solution to their problem. When they had merged the armies of M23, early along, those who were, had their grievances, into they integrated it into the national army. Mm -hmm. What caused them to go back? Because they realized the issue, they are still feeling the same pain from within. They went back to the bush. So you can say, over time, if someone can fight a war on the, on, on, a, a, on the basis of their existence, that person will not stop there should be a lasting solution that should be generated from within Congo. So the answer to the Congolese problem is with Congolese people, not Ugandans, not, not people of Rwanda, uh -huh. not, not uh, Sadak, not, and entirely as East African community, the sense of brotherhood is really going. We look at each other's enemies, we call them Congolese are fighting, they are coming as refugees. We should look at ourselves as people in a challenged situation that is being propelled at the same time catalyzed by other forces from outside who are our enemies. And then let the Congo settle its problem. Otherwise, they are our brothers and what happens in the neighborhood, at the end of the day, there is a spillover. Refugees, we have explosions. Recently I was in Nivanda and we met uh, some people across the families that lost those six people from, I think, Kamwenge that were cut and their heads were chopped off. It, was, it is a very threatening situation. It is just a spillover of the war. It has helped Congo in finding, in soul searching, as I said, finding what their issue is from within and let them solve it themselves. Thank you. Interesting. Winnie. 
your comments on Kwanga? I wouldn't really say anything that really differs from what the both have said, but uh, I, I also still believe that their issues are actually internal, much as uh, they say it's considered uh, one of the poorest countries in the world, much as it's also one of the countries with the richest uh, mineral reserve. I believe um, by the time fire catches up in a family, in a household, there should actually be tactics from within the family members, within the context, let's say within the Congo, Congolese people to see how they can actually put off this fire. And that uh, if that fire is not put off or if they don't take measures by themselves to actually sit and negotiate, uh, by the time they'll start bringing in other people, other mediators from outside, aid from other air, from other countries to come and support them in trying to resolve this issue, it actually just adds fuel into the fire because you don't know what these other parties are coming, what interest, what angle they're coming in. Because being a country that's very rich in terms of minerals, everyone is coming in with their own context of interest, which the Congolese people, the government, isn't really understanding. And that takes it, I believe, uh, it also brings in a toil where the government has its interest in terms of what it's receiving from the, the aid that is coming, as well as the rebels also have what they actually uh, perceive as the interest they need uh, in terms of the aid that is also coming. So there's that kind of, uh, uh, how can I call it? There's that kind of uh, difference that is happening between those rebels and the government that actually tells you that this issue is internal. And if they come together and agree on a way forward of what they really need or what they really see, the future they see for their country as Congo, that would be one of the ways they'd mitigate because the issue in Congo has really gone on for years and years and years. And however much the aid has really been coming, realize that the more aid comes, the more these issues spark up. And that just gives you an understanding that this issue is within and they really just need to cut off. Now that the different aids have pulled out, mm -hmm. it's time for the country to sit as them and then analyze the situation and see where they have gone wrong as a citizens and just map out and have a way forward in, how, in order for them to see how they can address some of these issues because it's really taking the country backwards in terms of education development and safety and also in terms of regional integration because East Africa is really pushing for let's have this integration, economic integration, realize that it's now becoming a security threat to the community and that is something that's going to affect their development much as they are a young entity within the community of the East African uh, community. Yeah. Wow, fantastic. I remember the time words. Uh, thank you. I just feel sorry for Congo. He has had a lot of leadership troubles since Mobutu come to, up to here, where they have Felix Shikegi. Mm. Part of their challenges, uh, they have wrong friends, wrong neighbors. They are now in a wrong <laughs> com stuff. They are now in a wrong community. Internally, whatever is being in Congo is externally influenced. Uh, I feel Congo that in all decisions it made, uh, to me I felt it would be safer if it joined the ECOWAS than joining East African community because being big, you can take uh, alliance with people, with people in the other, because you can't be neighbored by Kagame who came as a rebel under the PF by Museveni who was a rebel. Is lying, is making for you roads in Congo. They have now withdrawn the army from Uganda from Congo. The confusion it has gone through because of its <laughs> nature of friends and neighbors is enough package for Congo to learn. Who should be your friend? Who should you make alliance with? Shekedi came, and one of the rich Shekedi should have Shekedi is coming to power. He came to Entebbe, made an alliance. Whatever aid Museven gave him, he helped him attain presidency. Whatever aid Kagame gave him, He's now a president, he now feels these people are not right friends. I saw the UN questioning Rwanda from their being giving aid to the M23 rebels. But these are, these are people who also came in the very style. They know very well what they are doing. Over 90 rebel groups in a country, that each rebel group has captured its own territory. Part of those rebel groups include Ugandans, like ADF. <laughs> those are your neighbors. I'm giving you an... Whatever Congo is passing through, in, not even Venezuela or any part in the world has Congo situation. You have wrong neighbors, wrong alliances, 
everything in Congo at the moment needs prayer because it is a bad situation given that it is a country which would have put Africa far given its resource value, its positioning geographically. It is so rich apart from even minerals, but the culture. The Congolese have sold the best music in Africa. They have sold a lot of variety of sport. If you go to their clubs, Kiki Mazembe, Vitawa, they have had a lot of influence on the black part of Africa, not the Arab <laughs> part. Mm -hmm. On us, the dark Africans. So I just feel sorry for them. I can just pray. They get into consciousness on who their friend should be who their rightful neighbor should be. Because when I heard President Museveni saying he's going to make roads in Congo, they are passing a budget. He has had the IC Congo joining East African community. A few months ago, we are withdrawing Ugandan soldiers from Congo because the Congolese government has chased us. I really felt sorry for them. Simple as that. Wow, very interesting. I don't know... <laughs> They can change many things. I don't know if they can change who their neighbors are. <laughs> I think that's part with There are people who can stay near you, then they can, there's your neighbor. Yes. There's someone who just stays next to your gate, but there's your neighbor. Interesting, interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Ivan, from the Forum for Democratic Change. Julius, thank you very much from uh, Advocate Research, Advocate Research Institute, uh, no, Facility rather. Thank you, Willie, um, for your advocacy in terms of youth empowerment and um, development. Alan, our budding young legal, legal scholar, thank you for the time. Of course, to the viewers, it's always a pleasure having you every single Wednesday. To the technical team, thank you for ensuring that this show airs right in time at 2 p.m. Well, until next week, same time, same place, have a lovely evening.